so the next uh, speaker will be a trainee, and so that will be Umberto Monsive, who has a master degree and is currently a PhD candidate in medical physics in the Didact Lab uh, at Purdue University in the States. Yes, hello. Uh, let me just share my presentation. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Humberto Monsivais, and as, uh, I am a PhD candidate in medical physics at Purdue University. And today we'll be talking about our uh, ultra theoretical time magnetism transfer uh, imaging for the brain. Uh, it's a method that was developed here at Purdue. So first, I'll just go quickly over the basics of magnetization transfer. So it is basically a process by which the macromolecules um, and their closely related um, associated water molecules in the two poles exchange uh, their magnetizations. So basically, typically, you, you always think about imaging the uh, water content in the brain using T1-weighted or T2-weighted imaging. And we're sensitive to the water content changes. Uh, so that will be the free water pool, which is this um, narrow band in blue. But there's also a macromolecular pool, which are more like the bound protons. So these are protons that are bound to macromolecules like lipids and proteins, and these are invisible to MRI. So you cannot directly measure this component because their T2s are too short uh, in the order of uh, microseconds. So the idea behind uh, magnetization transfer is to indirectly probe this relationship, like the relationship between the bound and, and unbound protons to gain information about the pathological changes that can be associated with like tissue demyelination or like increased uh, metal deposition in neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and then the way you do that in, in vivo is that you apply uh, magnetization poles uh, off the frequency of water. So somewhere between two or 1.5 kilohertz, you saturate the macromolecular pole and as they exchange their magnetization with the free water pool, the long T2 or like the free water pool contrast decreases. So in summary, it is a way to enhance the contrast of the bound pool relative to the free pool. Uh, and it's sensitive to T1 relation changes and many other things. So that's just, um, so in our um, early stages of uh, testing this, 3D dual echo, ultra short echo uh, sequence at Purdue, we noticed that at the shortest echo time, the uh, signal intensity of the iron rich areas in the brain will actually increase. Uh, so we perform a phantom experiment to characterize this relationship. That's what you can see here. And it shows that as this iron concentration increased, so did the signal in the UTE sequence because because it's at the ultra short echo time. So at this point, we're not really losing a lot of the signal. We're not having a lot of T2 star effects uh, from what we see right now. And also we compare that to a multi echo, a conventional GRE sequence, and we don't see about the same effect, like the signal decays much faster. And we believe that's you know, all because of the longer echo times uh, in the order of milliseconds and not microseconds. Uh, so our idea was to combine the benefits of both of these approaches. So the ultra short echo time that you know has is very sensitive to ultra short T2, and we see an increased signal with uh, uh, increased iron concentration, and the magnetization transfer, which will enhance the contrast of this uh, the bound pool relative to the free pool which is also sensitive to T1 changes. So we just want to combine those two effects and we hypothesize that that will enhance in the contrast of the deep iron rich areas um, in the brain even more. Uh, so just for a couple um, experiments that we uh, did, we scan a couple of volunteers in our uh, treatments Prisma T2 scanner with a 20 channel head coil and we scan it with three different sequences. So the UTE sequence, uh, which is dual echo, the first echo at 20 microseconds, and the second echo was at about four milliseconds. 
uh, was kind of with that, with the UTMT, which in included an empty pulse uh, using antibiotic hyperbolic uh, secant pulses, and then a conventional uh, vendor sequence that uses uh, like Siemens flash, 3D flash, that was uh, empty weighted. So we uh, follow a protocol that has been established for a long time. Uh, and this is just more of the parameters. So they're both uh, roughly one millimeter isotropic with the UT a little bit uh, higher resolution. And then uh, they were both accelerated uh, about twice, uh, 2.5 for the UT MT. Uh, here are the acquisition times. So we do have longer acquisition times for the UTE sequence. Uh, but um, And then the reconstruction, we use the BAR toolbox and a like, simple regrading um, for the UTE. The UTE give us a lot of data because it has a lot of pedals and a lot of FID points. So we are only using about 40% of the data uh, to use this simple regrading and it's still giving us pretty good results. For the conventional imaging, we use the vendor DICOM images that come up with the scanner and we process them through the HMRI toolbox in MATLAB. Yeah, all this was processed in MATLAB. Uh, so here's kind of the method. So once we got our images, uh, we co-register the UT images to the empty weighted vendor sequence. And then after that, we co-register that this same, um, the empty weighted image to the MNI template and apply the same transformations to the other UTE images. Uh, and then we perform a ACNI 3D unifies to normalize everything to the white matter. And we uh, did a ROI analysis of all these uh, iron rich brain areas, such in the basal ganglia. So that will be the putamen, uh, carded nucleus, the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra, and the, uh, as I meant to say here, this, this should be dentate nucleus in the cerebellum. So here are some of our initial results. Uh, we did this, this kind of how I drew the RRIs uh, in the in the empty images. We see an increased contrast between the gray matter and white matter uh, throughout this all of these regions, specifically uh, higher in the substantia nigra and the Dante nucleus when we compare it to the regular UTE that has. Now, it doesn't have a lot of contrast between the gray matter and white matter. It looks more like a protein density image. And then the conventional empty weighted flash. Uh, I forgot to mention, like, this uh, this processing, like, uh, corrects for a lot of things. So it's uh, correct for the inhomogeneity. So we do acquire an RF map for, uh, and the sensitivity map for the head coil and, and the body coil. And then the software, the toolbox itself, does an extrapolation to a TE of zero for all of the maps. So this is what we use for the empty weighted flash. Uh, for the UTMT, we, it was very simple, just regrading of the 40% of the case space data. And this is, we still see improved contrast, uh, even though we haven't done a lot of corrections to the UT data. Uh, here's just a more overview of how the data looks like. So on the top, we have the UTE at the 20 microsecond time with no empty pulse. Then the same the same um, sequence, but with the empty pulse applied. And then the empty weighted uh, extrapolated to zero uh, echo time. So you see this, both these two look very similar, uh, but once we did the RI analysis, this still show a higher ratio of uh, gray matter to white matter contrast. And yeah, the UT, MT, UT doesn't have as much contrast as shown here. So in conclusion, I mean, we have seemed to show that it is that our hypothesis is uh, almost like it's in the right direction that we do see an enhancement of these brain regions, uh, but we wanna do more studies to sort of characterize what is the dynamic range of, of the UTM sequence. Uh, we wanna assess the contrast, how the contrast changes as a function of saturation frequency and the flip angles. And obviously we want to compare it with more volunteers and also uh, use compressed sensing since we are only using, not we're not using the full case space data. We want to use, we're only using 40%. We do want to do a more proper reconstruction uh, that is not just the regrading. And also we can accelerate it further and do denoising of the data before we uh, get the final results. Um, 
So here are my acknowledgements. Uh, this is all my, my lab group, my academic advisor, and my Dr. Amir, who supervised this as well, uh, my funding sources. Uh, yes, thank you. you have any questions? Thank you so much for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions? Sorry. <clears throat> There's no questions in the chat yet, but I would have one question. So um, do you see this technology being used more for segmentation of these subcortical structures or more for uh, assessing the iron density in, the, in these structures? Uh, I mean, it could be both, I guess. I know there are studies that have shown that the MT weighted uh, images are give better results for segmentation like I said, of the cortical structures. Uh, the way that we were looking at this more is to actually do an assessment of like biomarker of neurodegenerative diseases, especially with the iron content that uh, because we have a really short echo time, we think that it will be better to, you know, assess those structures that are affected in neurodegenerative disorders. But I mean, I, I think it could go either way <laughs> as far as, yeah. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, still no questions in the chat. Okay, so I guess if there is no other questions, we're going to move forward with the program. Thank you again for your talk. Thank you. Um,